Well, hi everyone. Nice to see you here again live for another virtual story time here at Discovery Mountain. So we've had some interesting weather here in Colorado during these past few days where we've been meeting every day. And I've been telling you how it was sunny and warm and then it snowed. Well, I'm happy to tell you that it's sunny and it's warm again. So <laughs> that's a Colorado spring for you. We have warm weather and we have snow and we have new flowers blooming out in the yard, but the flowers occasionally get covered up by snow. So that's just how it goes here for weather. And I hope that at your home that things are nice and that you're able to get outside and have a, um, a little breath of fresh air, which me makes staying at home a lot easier when we can get outside and do a few things, doesn't it? Well, today we are going to read the conclusion of the story we've been reading these many days of Mary Jones and her Bible. We finally get to hear the last chapter of this book, which is exciting because it's a good ending. But before we read that, uh, let's talk for a couple minutes about another thing that you might be able to do while you have some free time on, on your hands and while you are um, being a good citizen and staying indoors, staying at home anyway. So something that I started having as a hobby, but it is now my job, <laughs> is writing. And maybe you like to write, and that's a fun hobby of yours as well. Well, I wanna to talk to you for a couple minutes and give you some ideas on writing if that's something that interests you. You know, um, there are many different parts to making a Discovery Mountain episode, and lots of things that have to happen and come into place for an episode to be created, but they really fall into three main categories. And the first is um, the writing of the content. So you can't have any of the production or anything that happens without the script. And so that script or that story has to come first. And then the second part is the actual production of that story. So you have to bring the words from the screen or the paper, you have to bring them to life. And that happens during production. And if you follow us um, right here on Facebook or on Instagram, you've seen, you've seen our stories from when we're in the studio and we're creating episodes. Um, and then the third part is we have to take what happens in the studio and it has to be edited and music added and then that's called post-production and then it's ready for a review process, and then it's ready for you to hear. So essentially, most of the time, I'm the person writing the script, so I'll talk to you a little bit more about it. Hi, you guys, nice to see you here again. And then um, the production of what happens in the studio, that second step, producer Steve, who I hope you've had a chance to meet, he, co he coordinates what's gonna happen in there and which voice actors come in when, and he's a voice actor himself, so he has to schedule himself into that. And then we have the crew that is responsible for pushing the right buttons to make the soundboard work and following along the script to keep director Doug on track. And so that's, that's where producer Steve really shines. That's his areas during production. And then, of course, director Doug is sitting behind the mic and he's directing the voice actors during that production. And then when we're finished, we put all of those files, all of those audio files onto a big hard drive and director Doug takes them back to his home in Toronto, Canada, where he and the sound engineer, Danny Columbi, who's also in Ontario, Canada, uh, where they then do the post-production, that third step. So uh, in the coming weeks or maybe in a month or so, you're going to see some articles by producer Steve on the website and you'll be able to read a little bit if the technical part of making an episode is what's really interesting to you. It's fascinating. He'll give you some tips on equipment and he might even inspire you to do some record voice recording at home. Uh, whether you want to audition for Discovery Mountain, you just want to make your own audio story. Good tips there. So those aren't, aren't there yet he's actively working on them I know he is you'll see those try I won't put him on a timeline but try again in maybe a month and then you should see that 
Well, and if you haven't watched some of Director Doug's videos yet of how he does the post-production and how he makes some of the sound effects, I really encourage you to go and watch those. They're on discoverymountain.com. You can just scroll down the homepage. There's a whole Director Doug section there, and there you'll see all of the videos he's created. And there's some really, really interesting ways that he makes sound effects, things that you would never guess. <laughs> so those are fun. So now let me talk to you about my part, which is creating the stories for Discovery Mountain. So I'm not the only writer. I am um, the only writer who who, ha, who um, does full seasons, but I've had some people help me with full seasons, and one is Natalie Barton, and she plays Madam Manager. You know her. She and I co-wrote one full season. Um, when we did the season on creation uh, with the dinosaurs, Rich Aguilera really assisted me in writing that one. And then uh, quite a few people have helped write mini adventures. So um, Natalie Barton's written quite a few of those. She had her sisters help her on one, which is really neat. Um, Janice Nelson in California, she's written a number of those. She does a great job. And then Joy Hubble. I think she is our youngest um, writer for Discovery Mountain. And Joy wrote the mini adventure that you're going to hear this coming Wednesday. It's called The Field Trip. And uh, Mrs. Lee and some of her students go on a field trip to Hadassah's Observatory. And if you listen right to the end you'll hear that in the credits that Joy Hubble wrote that one um, and she's a teen so if writing a mini adventure is something that you'd be interested in doing well listen here and then uh, be sure to send us a message too and we can send you some more information more detailed information based on this you know I'm I'm thinking I might be missing someone when I'm listing all those authors so <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I'm trying to think who else has written a mini adventure for us. Um, I know my friend Cynthia is working on some. She hasn't completed any yet. I know producer Steve is thinking about writing one. And I know Naomi, my daughter, is thinking about writing one, but she hasn't yet. So forgive me if I missed anyone, but I think I, I got everyone. So how does it work? Sometimes people ask me, how, how do I write a season? So as you know, a season is either a six or or we did, we did a couple, we did one five part um, season and then we did a couple 10 part at the beginning, but generally it's a six part series of stories and they all are focused around a Bible story. So I always start with the Bible story when I'm writing a new season. Um, I think about what story in the Bible is meaningful to me or perhaps it's really meaningful to what's going on in our world today, or it's just a really important message that I think that you all would enjoy listening to. And so I start with the Bible story and then I go from there. So let's think back to the last full season that you were able to listen to, season 12, Harmony Corner. So the Bible story for that was the story of Nehemiah and how Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem and helped the people to rebuild the wall of their city. You remember that. And um, so I, that's, I, I start by really, really learning that Bible story and making sure that I understand it. And then I think about the town of Discovery Mountain and how the things that happen in the Bible story can happen sort of like a parable in the town of Discovery Mountain. And so you saw um, in the Bible story, the wall is broken down and it has to be repaired and rebuilt, right? And so in season 12, the church is broken down and it needs to be repaired. And in the Bible story, Nehemiah kind of leads out and helps the people. He's the team leader. And in the Discovery Mountain parallel story, Pat, we meet Pastor Peabody and he leads out and he helps the people to um, work as a team and to fix the church up. So that's how that works. So uh, the first step in actually writing is to then think through, I have to think, okay, I know what, what what's going to happen and I know what happens in the Bible story. How do I divide that between six episodes? So that's the big picture stuff. And then I have to go back and look at each of the six episodes and think about um, how what happens there will lead into the next episode. But we also want something to kind of be a unique storyline per episode. So if you remember season 12, episode 2, 
I think it was called Midnight Mission or Mission at Midnight. <laughs> I don't have it right in front of me. I'm sorry. But in the, it's definitely season 12, episode 2. You remember uh, Peabody's trying to get into the church and he can't find the keys, right? So that looking for the keys storyline continued just through that episode. And we figured it out during that episode. You didn't have to wait till the next one to have resolution on that. So that's how that works. So um, if you are, are someone who loves to write or wants to try your hand at writing, let me tell you how you can write a mini adventure. And feel free to write to us for more info or just run with it right now and send us, send us what you create. So with mini adventures, um, <clears throat> essentially you walk through a process and this is actually the what I call a scribble sheet that I use for when I write mini adventures. You can see at the very top there, it says uh, mini scribble sheet. I don't know if that's an actual term, but that's what I call it. And then there's a spot for the faith exercise. That's where you have to start with is with your Bible verse and your faith exercise. And then the characters that are going to be in it. Uh, mini adventures need to have a, a maximum of three characters. We don't want any more than that because it gets to be too much work for our director Doug to post produce. And then the setting. We also can keep mini adventures happening in one spot. So if the story starts in the school, it stays in the school. If it starts at camp, it stays at camp, that kind of thing. And then I walk through these six steps. So I always start by thinking, after I have the faith exercise, there's a problem. And then we take a couple of attempts throughout the story to solve that problem. And then, let's see, I can't even read this. And then everything seems to kind of fall apart. <laughs> and then there's an answer to that problem, a resolution. Your characters figure out their problem. And then, of course, we talk about how our faith exercise played into this. I call that the spiritual application. So maybe that's inspired you while you have some free time at home that you might want to write a mini adventure. And I would love to hear from you and to read those and maybe we can actually record it. And um, if you're very serious about this, do write to producer Steve because um, some characters are available for mini adventures and some aren't. So if you really wanna hear yours get turned into an actual mini adventure, be sure to reach out to us, okay? All right, I think enough about that. I think it's time for our story. So we are on the last chapter, chapter eight, of Mary Jones and her Bible. Remember, uh, last time she had that long walk and she got her Bible and that was so exciting. I was so happy for her and I'm sure you were too. Well, let's begin with chapter eight. A quiet peace now settled on Mary's soul. Morning and evening, she read aloud from her Bible to her parents, intending to read from the beginning to the end. And we have one last picture, let's see here. Here is Mary reading to her parents, morning and evening. <clears throat> is that nice? For the first time, she realized that the books were a continuous, a continuous history that followed the Israelites from their glorious escape from slavery in Egypt to their captivity in Babylon. She found new stories of people and places which she had never read in chapel or Sunday school. By reading through each complete book, she grasped for the first time the real meaning of the extracts that she had until then now only partly understood. Many were the quiet discussions that Mary and her parents had in those days. Mary still did odd bits of sewing for her neighbors and was getting quite skilled in dressmaking. And now that she had left school, she found that she could do even more work than her commissions brought her. So she learned to take her turn at her mother's loom, and she still found time to attend to the needlework as well as her bees and her chickens and her garden. Remember, she took up beekeeping to make a little money. <laughs> she had a busy, happy life. The church service and Sunday school served as a meeting place for friends. She was utterly unconscious that her past struggle to save enough money for a Bible and her long walk to Bala and the bitter tears shed there were to play a momentous part in forming a great society. To her, all that was a thing of the past, but not so with Reverend Thomas Charles. Mary's story and her despairing tears clung to his memory. They brought into dark relief the bitter need of his country's people, for Mary's need was the need of Wales, so she represented what everyone in her country really needed. 
uh, Reverend Charles visited the villages of North Wales even more widely and became more and more convinced of that need. Being in the Town District one day, he called at the Joneses' cottage. He found Mary deep in the mysteries of weaving, her mother patiently instructing her at the loom. Oh, Mr. Charles, cried Mary when she had pulled forward her father's armchair for their, for their visitor. I am going to be a weaver like mother and father. And I expect you are getting on famously, replied Mr. Charles. Yes, sir, said Mrs. Jones, answering for, answering for Mary, who looked a little self-conscious. But she wants to get on too quickly. She was ever one to want to get things done. <laughs> Mr. Charles picked up the end of the piece of cloth that Mary's efforts had produced, and even his unprofessional eye could see that it was not perfect, though creditable for a beginner. You will make a good weaver in time, Mary, he said quietly. Have you ever thought, he went on, addressing her parents now, as well as Mary, that we are all weavers in life's fabric, that is, in God's creation and kingdom, weavers of good and evil? Look back at the earliest pages of Bible history, how solemn a thought it is to see what a weaving of sorrow Eve made in the world by her disobedience. But on the other hand, how happy Ruth would have been if she had been told even a part of the wonderful influence her life and conduct would have upon countless generations to come. Yes, sir, broke in Jacob Jones, and I have often said he said here in this room that our dear Mary is a very Ruth to her parents. Yes, indeed, answered Mr. Charles. We will know what a rich thread she has woven into the pattern. We, sorry, we little know what a rich thread she has woven into the pattern of life. Oh, sir, shyly stammered Mary, surprised and overcome by his remark. What have I done? <laughs> we shall see, Mary, answered Mr. Charles. God has all our efforts for good in his keeping, and his word shall not return unto him void. They talked for a while of other matters, the Sunday school and the improvement in the children in the district. And as he turned to leave, he said, I'm going to London, Mary, to plead for more Bibles. Pray for me. And in December of 1802, Mr. Charles went to London, and at a meeting of the Religious Tract Society, he told the story of Mary Jones, pointing out that she was but one example of the dire need of the Welsh people for Bibles in their own language. Mary's story made a deep impression. When Mr. Charles had finished his appeal, he sat down, a prayer in his heart, and his hearer that his hearers would be moved to do something to make this happen. This in his mind had now become the only way to relieve the spiritual destitution of his people. There was a silence in the room as he sat, his eyes cast down on the table, waiting. Then a Reverend Joseph Hughes rose from his chair. Mr. Charles, he said, your appeal has moved us all very much. The story of that young girl is truly heartrending, and hers is the story of the world. Oh, so Mary represented the need of her country, but also the need of each of us, of the whole world. You speak of your hope of forming a society for printing and distributing Bibles in Wales. But I say, if for Wales, why not for the world? A deep murmur of agreement ran around the table, and then members of the committee began to bring forward different suggestions. They were unanimous that a new society should be formed. The secretary was there and then instructed to write a letter inviting all Christians of all churches to unite in supporting the work. The enthusiasm was tremendous, and Mr. Charles could hardly believe that his great hope had become a reality. And so it happened that on December 7th, 1802, the British and Foreign Bible Society was conceived. And on March the 7th, 1804, when the initial arrangements had been completed, the first meeting was held and 700 pounds was raised. So a pound is um, an, a unit of currency. It's like our dollar, the British pound. It's like our dollar. 
Mr. Charles had returned to Wales, but how he rejoiced to hear that the work of the Bible Society had really begun. He soon made excuse to visit the, visit the Aberginawyn district and walked up to Lanfey Hangel. He found Mary in the cottage garden. Mary Jones, he said, I have something to tell you, and as I am sure your parents will be glad to hear it too, we will go into the house. They went into the cottage, and Mr. and Mrs. Jones stilled their looms to welcome the visitor. After inquiries about the health of the family, Mr. Charles told the great news. A society has been founded, he said, that will devote itself to printing and distributing the scriptures throughout the world. The world? Mary softly exclaimed. Yes, it is wonderful, replied Mr. Charles. No more begging and praying for a few Bibles. We shall have all that we need. As it grows in strength, this society will supply the world with scripture. Well, sir, said Jacob, that is grand news indeed. When I think of our little Mary striving on as she did until she could buy that expensive Bible, I do rejoice that it may become easier for the poorer folk in Wales and in the rest of the world to get one. Oh, it is wonderful, cried Mary, but I am not sorry that I had to work so hard for my Bible. It only makes it more precious to me. And now we are hoping that good Christian folk will be generous in their giving for this great work, said Mr. Charles. We have had a splendid start, 700 pounds from the first meeting. I am sure the money will come in, said Mrs. Jones. Why, when they hear about it, everyone will want to help. And so it was. As the news of the Bible Society spread throughout Wales, subscriptions poured into the head office and nearly 1,900 pounds was raised, mostly from the poorer people of the county, of the country. When Mr. Charles had gone, Mary threw a shawl over her head. I must run up and tell Mrs. Jones the farm, Mrs. Evans the farm at once, she said, and she ran out of the cottage. She arrived breathless at the farm and found Farmer Evans in the house as well as Mrs. Evans. Oh, Mr. Evans, oh, Mrs. Evans, there has been started a most wonderful society in London that is going to provide Bibles for the Welsh people and for all the world. Isn't it splendid? Oh, well, well, cried Mrs. Evans, that will mean cheaper Bibles and a chance to get one too, which the people have never had, whether they were rich or poor. Who told you about it, Mary? Mr. Charles, Mary answered. He has just now been to our cottage. He was so pleased that he could hardly tell us. It will be a grand work, said Farmer Evans. I must see about it being made known in our chapel and get a collection going. We must support that society with all we can give. Good morning, Julie and family. Aye, that we must, agreed Mrs. Evans heartily. And that was the spirit all up and down the country. The talk was all of this new society and everyone gave like the first Christians as they were able. Those were happy days in Wales. Enthusiasm for this new enterprise ran like a fire through the whole nation. A sense of, of religion and worship awoke in the country even before the scriptures actually came to hand. And when the first consignment of Bibles in the Welsh language arrived in Bala in 1806, a great song of thanksgiving went up from all the churches. The movement was wholeheartedly supported by everyone, William Wilberforce and others in London, and in Wales, Dr. Warren, Bishop of Bangor, and Dr. Burgess, Bishop of St. David's, all joined with Mr. Charles in the work of distributing Bibles to the many schools so much in need of them. Mary Jones followed the progress of the work with the keenest interest. By this time, she was a teacher in the Sunday school, and she always remembered the strange thrill of joy that she felt on the first Sunday when Bibles were handed out to the children to read and to study in their Sunday school class. She knew now that the story of her own struggle had played its part in the foundation of the Bible Society. And without a thought of pride or self-congratulation, she rejoiced to see this day. Well, that's the end of Mary's story. But what happened next? Well, let's read just another paragraph. 
It says the British and Foreign Bible Society is not now the only Bible society in the world. Other great societies came into existence to help with the work. The National Bible Society of Scotland in 1826, the American Bible Society in 1816, and the Bible Society of the Netherlands in 1814 are just a few of the other societies formed. These all these all now form a great worldwide family called the United Bible Societies with one aim, to make the Bible available to everyone in the common languages of mankind or humankind. The people of Wales, in the person of Mary Jones, planted a tree which now has many branches and spreads throughout the world. Isn't that wonderful? And here at the back of the book are some examples of what the writing looks like of some of the local uh, languages that the Bible is now printed in. That back in Mary Jones's time, the Bible wasn't printed in these. So there's Telugu, Burmese, let's see. And this book, of course, as I told you before, was printed in uh, 1949. So some of these languages might even look, and these alphabets might even look a little bit different now than they did when this book was printed in 1949. And certainly the Bible has, is continuing to be translated and made available to people around the world. You know, Mary Jones, she inspired, she inspired a movement and she inspired uh, the creation of a Bible society that meant very early in the 1800s, in the first half of the 1800s, suddenly people who never were able to read the Bible for themselves could have a Bible. And that was around the world. That was in Wales, that was in Europe, and that was here in America. Um, all across the world, this started to happen. And you know, the church that I'm a part of started uh, not long after this. And so I believe that Mary Jones um, making Bibles available for everyone to read and study on their own, that really spurred people to to have a love and a passion to know God's word for themselves, not just to take the preacher's word for it. So I encourage you, um, I hope that Mary Jones's story has in inspired you and inspired you to really appreciate the Bible. And if you're like most people uh, nowadays, the Bibles, plural, that you own. Um, the Bible is a rich, wonderful treasure, and our lives can only be touched and impacted by it when we spend time reading it. It doesn't do us any good when it's just looking pretty sitting on a shelf. It makes a difference in our life when we digest God's Word and we allow it to change us, change us and draw us closer to Him. Well, that's the end of Mary Jones and her Bible. Thank you so much for joining me every day here on Facebook Live. So we'll meet again, but not until... Saturday, okay? So my friends Laura and Lori over at Guide Magazine have sent me another guide story. So I am going to look at that this week and next Saturday, probably at the same time, probably at 11 a.m. my time, so whatever time it's been in at your, uh, your home where you are. Let's meet again for another guide story, okay? And until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay positive. Bye!